Hey, good afternoon. Scott Luton and Greg White with you right here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's live stream. Gregory, how are we doing? We are doing fantastic, Scott. How are we doing? We being you. It's Hey, you know we got a break from the heat. It was yeah. a cool 80 degrees yesterday in Metro Atlanta. Yes. Loving every minute of it. Uh, who, who knows? Maybe I'll be able to grow some tomatoes finally. Uh, still working on that garden, but it's been a great week thus far, Greg. Yeah, it has. Uh, the deer have eaten well in our garden. We've, we've grown tomatoes, um, and we've, we've fed the local fauna with them. <laughs> well, and hey, inadvertently. That's right. Uh, tune in uh, every Wednesday at 12 noon for Garden Time with Scott and Greg. Right. We'll save that for next week. Uh, right. <laughs> today's this show. is the problem with the supply chain, deer. That's, that's right. Hey, today's show, we're talking about the adventurous world of ocean freight, global yeah. freight, you name it, and a lot more. And Greg, I do have a question for you, my friend. Mm. Will ocean freight sink holiday shopping? Ooh, I like that play on words. Is that a pun? Technically, I think a pun. Yeah, I like that. That's a good play on words. Um, I, I think if it will, the impact has already been seen. I mean, I, I think it's probably hard for people who've not been in retail to relate that most peak goods have landed by now, right? Um, you know, you got to think about this time of year. There's always a backup this time of year because you've got back to school. You've got the pre-Christmas holidays, Christmas, all of the other holidays that uh, come into that and, you know, into that same time period. Um, it is a crushing time of year for for supply chains generally, but this time of year, I'm going to say if you haven't landed your goods, you may not have a peak season. Right. We talked, I, you know, I did a commentary on this last week um, about somebody I think said, not they're not even Captain Obvious, they're Captain Too Late, uh, said <laughs> if you haven't placed your orders for peak by now, that it's probably too late. Let me and I my response to that was if you haven't landed your goods by now, you're you're coming up on too late really, really fast. There'll be a lot of grants across global supply chain for sure in the months ahead. But hey, today Hey, this is America. We'll figure out some other way to spend money. <laughs> we can't buy presents. But today, Greg, we're gonna be learning a lot more about the world wide world, crazy world, wild, wild west world yeah. of Ocean Freight, and then some with our friends at UPS, specifically Steve McMichael with UPS Global Freight Forwarding. So stay tuned for a highly informative conversation. That's so right. That, they don't have to trust me today. They get to hear it from somebody who actually knows. Right. Um, <laughs> but before we bring Steve on, let's say a hello to a few folks that are already tuned in here. Hey, Peter Bole, all night and all day. Is oh, back with I was us. a little worried about the day when we didn't see him the other day. <laughs> well, I think he's playing some golf so we may not traveling see yes yeah that yeah we may not see a lot of them here today but regardless hopefully you are doing well there pb nerfad he uh i imagine will, will uh be bringing a lot of pov here today and he's got yeah, i want to hear what he's seeing for he's sure he's got a new headshot nerfad i like it fatherhood looks good on you man and yes, i've enjoyed sir. seeing your pictures of the family so great to have you joseph moretta host of a new podcast up there in the uh, Northeast. Uh, so Joseph, hope this finds you well. Great to have you here today. Uh, let's see. Hey, Rhonda Bumpenza Zimmerman, PhD. Dr. Rhonda is with us on time today. How about that? Yes. Guy? Yes. So something's going wrong on the West Coast. But <laughs> I did see a post. I think it was over the weekend. I think we need to hear what her hubby's employment status is at, at this juncture. Agreed. So, Rhonda. Also, I love his, I really dig his Euro trash haircut. I love that. I've, I've been trying to attempt that, but my wife will not let me do it. Uh, so Sheil is back with us today. Great to have you back uh, via LinkedIn. Uh, looking forward to hearing your perspective today. And I got to add one more before we bring in two more before we bring in Steve. So Nerfad is comparing weather notes with us. So uh, cheers from the Arctic where it's a balmy 88 degrees. Wow. Uh, and get this dad joke. I heard the disruptions in the ocean freight will bode a wavy holiday season. Ooh. Nerf well, five. it's better than sinking it, I suppose. <laughs> That's right. All right. So with no further ado, let's say a little bit. Not sure Steve is ready for this, all this comedy. <laughs> Sushmita, 
Great to have you here via LinkedIn. Let us know where you're dialed in from. Looking forward to your POV as well. Um, okay, so with no further ado, I want to bring in Greg, our uh, featured guest here today, Steve McMichael, Vice President, UPS Ocean Freight. Steve, good afternoon. How you doing? Hey, Scott. Hey, Greg. How are you? Outstanding. We, you uh, thought you thought you were going to have a serious discussion around supply chain today? Uh, didn't hey. you? Give me a break. Just give me a break for that from that. Today. How about that? <laughs> Especially with the with the kind of discussions you must be having right now. I figure we better have a little fun with it. You got to laugh or you cry, right? Let, let's do that. Let's do some laughing today. Let, well, we're going to start with the easy stuff. Oh, okay. yeah. I want to say good. hello to a couple of quick folks. Tim, uh, great to have you here. Really appreciate what you shared about your family and your service uh, to the country. So yeah. um, all the best to you wherever you are. Uh, Harmeet is tuned in via LinkedIn from Toronto. Great to have you here. And the one and only Gary Smith is with us from New York City. Greg is back on the right and all is right with the world. Okay. So, Steve, <laughs> starting with the easy stuff, my friend. Let's talk about where you grew up. Well, I'm a small town guy, guys. Uh, Jackson, Georgia. Uh, a little south of here. Um, that's uh, about 40 miles south of the Atlanta airport. Yeah, uh, Lake Jackson, yep. Grandpa's Farm, and uh, the best barbecue in the world, fresh air barbecue. Yeah. Yes. And we were talking, you know, all you got to say is food around here. Yeah. Uh, and you get everybody's attention. But fresh air barbecue is such a small world. Amanda and I have eaten at that place three or four or five times, oftentimes headed down to Jacksonville or other points in Florida. And it is, it's, it's one of a kind. Absolutely. So, and, is uh, there still sawdust on the floor? Absolutely. Is absolutely. there really? They actually had a little uh, kitchen fire there about a couple months ago that terrified the nation. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, <laughs> not just Jackson, the whole nation. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it's got quite a reputation. And, and just further down the road, uh, for any fans of fried green tomatoes, it is the backdrop for that movie. Uh, you know, that really right. illustrates some of George's um, uh, tradition for all Absolutely. things movie production, TV production, and more, and more, right? That's right. And don't forget Indian Springs State Park, High Falls, so all kind of culture and things down south. Wonderful. All right. So i got to say hello to T-Squared is back with us, Greg. He says, oh, it's been my. a while. I've got the good SCM nourishment, and I'm hungry. All right. Well, uh, T-Squared, <laughs> you tuned in for the right episode. Yeah, he did. Hey, sure. it, it, the other thing about Jackson, guys, and this microphone's got me back in my element, right? I, <laughs> I started right out of high school, did some local sports, and worked for WJGA Radio 92.1. <laughs> Let's hear your spiel in your radio voice, Steve. Come on. You know the crazy? It's Tradio. You can buy. <laughs> you want to buy, sell, swap, or trade anything, you call me at 775-7535. <laughs> Man. Steve, and you and I, I had more girlfriends that were at least 80 uh, that were uh, trying to sell me their kittens. <laughs> That's awesome. WJGA. We're, we're going to have to have you hang out after the show. We'll get some more stories there. But let's get to the heavy hitting stuff, Greg. So let's talk about yeah. National Chocolate Chip Cookie Day. Again, the fun stuff before we get to the, the serious world of freight. So yeah. it is National Chocolate Chip Cookie Day. Uh, I tell you, there's folks in my family, my mom, my, my nan growing up, could make some awesome chocolate chip cookies. But, Steve, who makes the best in your world? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, our, our cafeteria here at UPS has really good ones. But Really? I, oh, it's unbelievable. But, oh, that's dangerous work. Yeah, that's right. But I will have to go out and say, uh, let's go with Pillsbury. Throw that cookie dough on the oh, cast yeah. iron. Okay. And, and a lot of the, my UPSers listening know I'm going to do this, but put it on the Traeger. Put that cast iron on the Traeger. Okay. And uh, you that's a pellet that. grill for you anyone that that's doesn't That's right. Know. One of our best customers here at UPS on Ocean. And uh, that is how you make a chocolate chip cookie right there. Wow. Man, that's an exciting answer. So, Greg, <laughs> I'm not sure where to go from there. Well, I'll t let me tell you where I'm going to go from there because if I don't, I'm – I'm going to lose half my stuff. My wife makes the best chocolate chip cookies, Steve, and I will put them up against okay. anyone who is an expert because there's something she starts with the Toll House recipe, 
There you go. And then tweaks it <laughs> in ways that she hasn't yet decided to share. Okay. And man, it is just, it's the perfect All flavor. Right. I look people, forward to that contest. She, she used to, uh, she used to have people when they would get injured or have a life event or something like that, that she would make them chocolate chip cookies. And we had people who were claiming injury when they actually weren't <laughs> just to get cookies. So, man, all right. All right. We got to put that date on the calendar, Greg. <laughs> so, so you spent a lot of time talking about trading, which you're doing for a living, but also sports uh, in your days in Jackson. So tell us a little bit about, um, well, I, I want to hear a little about your past hobbies with your kids and, and what you're up to these days. Awesome. How are you getting your exercise? Uh, I need to get more exercise. I'm definitely doing too much ocean talk, but uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big golfer now uh, up in Cumming, Georgia, out there at Windermere. So part of the club core. So that's fun yeah. working on the golf game. But I'm a diehard baseball guy. Grew up playing it, started coaching it right out of high school. And uh, my oldest just retired. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, Sharon Springs is, is where my heart is. Uh, did the commissioner job. Uh, love being with the community. Love being with the kids. And uh, hung that up uh, last year. So wow. it's, time, it's time to play golf and do more ocean freight, I think. <laughs> Man, and I know you're doing a ton of ocean freight. So just to give us a little bit of an idea, I mean, title often belies the actual day to day of what someone does in their career. So tell us a little bit about what your what's a day in the life of Steve yeah. McMichael like? Absolutely. Uh, 17 years with UPS last week. Been a fun, congratulations! It's been a great ride. Um, prior to coming to UPS, I played on the retail. So those guys you were talking about earlier, uh, Target, Kmart, Polo Ralph Lauren. I know my old partners there are are, are sweating it right now because uh, yeah. holiday sales are upon us. And uh, obviously, we're supporting a lot of those guys out there, and we'll get into that. Um, but yeah, I am vice president UPS Ocean Freight, uh, based here in Alpharetta, Georgia at Supply Chain Solutions. Um, I took this role in 2015. Uh, prior to that, I was in Hong Kong for about three years, um, supporting our global operation over there. And, uh, cool. you know, and uh, yeah, it's been a fantastic ride. It's a great company. And uh, hey, we, we all know the mothership is very important in small package for UPS, but we're an integrator. We're a supply chain solutions company. And uh, we are a force to be reckoned with in ocean freight, too. And you've seen it from both sides of both shores, right? I mean, if you worked in, in Hong Kong, you watched a lot of ships launching to head to the States. And obviously, you know, since you're in charge of the uh, entire operation from this side, you have to be feeling the pain that the targets and other retailers are feeling right now. So can you no tell doubt. us a little bit about what you're seeing in yeah. the marketplace? I mean, this is my uh, 29th year and I've got ocean tattoos, no matter which company <laughs> I've been with. Have you been around Cape Horn? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I, I actually started my career at Fritz Companies, which okay. was an acquisition of UPS about 20 years ago. We celebrated that earlier this year, um, but everything ocean uh, my entire career. And uh, it's, I can honestly say I've never seen anything like what we're dealing with right now. Mm. Uh, we've dealt with crisis. We've dealt with the longshoreman strikes. We've dealt with the, the uh, 2009 when the vessels were all parked in Singapore, the right. Hanjin crisis. We've seen it all over the years. Uh, this has been going on now for at least 15, 16 months. And uh, we just call it the eternal peak season. <laughs> um, that it, it takes its toll on our people, on obviously our customers, and uh, our job is to to find solutions, to talk about it. Because look, CFOs, chief operating officers, are asking more and more questions because yeah. why? Cost have increased, um, and and inventory is down, and they've got to have product ready to hit the shelves and hit those production lines. Mm -hmm. You know, we've long been wanting wanting the respect and attention that supply chain has deserved and we've gotten it now and that's I, I have a feeling that's why 
so many people in the executive suite are so aware of this and um, you know, and it's a dual edged sword, isn't it? I mean, we were able to, in a way, not that anybody did this consciously, but we did kind of hide in the shadows, not because we wanted to, but because we were kind of stuffed there. But now we're right up front uh, with sales and other aspects of the business as companies talk about their earnings and sales and profits and whatnot. So, you know, we asked for it and we got it. And, and, mm -hmm. Did we ever, Steve? Mm, so I, I'm curious, as you look at the market and we talk about this kind of eternal peak season, you mentioned that is demand is demand the issue or is supply the issue? Is demand that much greater? And and if you have insight on it, and I'm not asking you to project, but if you have sure. insight on it, what do you think is is the greatest impact on the flux that we're seeing in this in the market right now. Yeah, I, th I think it flipped, right? When you go back to the first half of last year, the, the ocean carriers and the alliances have gotten really strong partnering together mm -hmm. and blank sailings meant if the demand wasn't there, we'll blank sail and we'll keep that, that, that uh, supply line right at the demand line. And then all of a sudden, you know, things started coming back in uh, the second half of the year it's been about demand ever since. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was on a panel with uh, CEO of Maersk uh, a few weeks ago, and he said, hey, our network as an industry can handle about a 30% flux. Right. And we are surpassing that right now. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, um, the vessels are full. They're putting in extra loaders every day, every week. Wow. Uh, and then, of course, you know, that's just to get port to port under control. When it gets to the U.S., we've got the additional challenges there with the, with right. the port congestion and the rail congestion. And and one thing that's really jumping out now is driver shortages. Yep. The good old drayage guys, the long haul guys are, are, are at capacity or uh, deciding not to work right now. Mm. Yep. Um, so those are all tied into the global ocean supply chain that we've got to work together with our customers to solve for. So you're, you're kind of speaking to that state of the ocean market address. And, and I want to uh, pose just a couple of quick comments here and we'll, we'll keep on going with your address, Mr. Vice President. Um, let's, uh, let's see here. So Clay, of course, uh, UPS iconic for their brown trucks, but there's a lot more. And Steve's speaking to a lot of the things that maybe some folks uh, may not be aware that UPS is involved in and leads. Vanessa, welcome. Your first time with us on a live stream. Let us know where you're tuned in from via LinkedIn. Great to have you here. Um, so Charles Heater's back with us, and I'm going to pose this question if it makes sense to you, uh, Steve, uh, if there's any insight here. He says, not sure if this is pertinent, but do you have any visibility to must arrive by date? And if so, how far out are we? Any any commentary there? Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the products that we have at UPS is called supplier management. I was actually brought here in 2004 to run that division of our ocean product, and it's heavily involved with retail, but getting those purchase orders way in advance and proactively managing that with suppliers, all with the focus of meeting that NDC date. Mm. There's so much, yeah. there's so many normals that are out there of, of just, you know, ship it on time and, you know, make sure it's on a vessel. But if you really plan it up front with those purchase orders and we can get down to an item SKU level, right? Planning with your manufacturers, letting our teams on the ground across the world proactively manage that because meeting that NDC date is so critical. Right now, the biggest challenge, of course, is what's dwell time mean now? How are we playing some of the predictive analytics that need to come along with what used to be a standard transit is obviously not standard in today's environment. Mm, mm. So um, I got to go back. I got to interrupt your address again here because <laughs> at, once you start talking barbecue and cookies, yeah, I know. it's uh -oh. still lingering. We'll, it's go still back, lingering. No, we'll go back to that. Rhonda talks about it's the best barbecue in Georgia, <laughs> fresh air barbecue. Uh, Jenny wants to know if she tuned into Supply Chain Chow. And hello, uh, <laughs> by the way, Jenny is tuned in from Johannesburg, South Africa. She leads nice. SAPIC. So, Jenny, great Good to have you here with us. And finally, David. I second that office has legit cookies. So David, great oh, there we you. go. That's one of my marketing guys out there. He's one of Alex's partners. Good to see you, David. That's I a love it. I, I think chocolate chip cookies could be a great recruiting tool. And I know everybody <laughs> on the carrier side needs needs That's help right. these days. So I love that. All right. So 
uh, I want to, before we move to, I know that y'all been involved in some unique uh, solutions, problem solving, and then some in this, in this crazy environment. Before we go there, um, Steve, anything else when, 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 as we're level setting kind of the current state of what we're seeing, any, what else would you add to that? Yeah. You know, yesterday, or maybe it was the day before, Good Morning America talked about, you know, your, your headline for the day of, you know, is it going to sink Christmas? Right. Well, let's, let's face it. My mom and your mom and grandma are going to watch that show and going to start shopping early, right? You know, so where is that going to put us in the inventory ranks? Um, you know, one of the things that we're certainly seeing is, and I didn't mention it earlier, customers are shipping earlier. But when it gets to your distribution center and you're already at capacity, where do you think they're sitting on that storage? They're, mm. sitting, on they're sitting on ocean containers. So if these containers aren't turning, we're not getting those empties back to, to China and the and Southeast of Asia. Um, it's just, it causes that, that full cycle um, that, that we all need to be aware of, right? Yep. That's why demurrage and detention charges are at an all time high on top of the ocean freight rates. Right. Um, so it, it's, it's an industry full of challenges, uh, a lot of frustration. You hear the word unprecedented, probably overused, um, you know, and I, you know, frustrations are clearly at an all time high, uh, even our operators, right? Just dealing with the ports, dealing with the local drage partners, dealing with the congestion in the rails. You know, it, this industry does take a toll on people. And uh, the more we can bring technology into it, or that we can bring advice to customers to take that pressure off of our people, is is all part of our game plan here at UPS for sure. Love it. Well, we're gonna get to some of the, the unique situations y'all been involved in. I want to share. Tim Ingram says hey, had a saying: "You don't notice us." And I think he's referring to supply chain folks when we're there, only mm -hmm. when we are not. COVID has changed that narrative. Uh, all together. Yeah, great point, Tim. Yeah. Jeff Odd. <laughs> That's a lot of years, 30 years in Ocean Freight. For that 30th anniversary, does UPS provide a green parrot that is shoulder trained? <laughs> Say it right there. <laughs> only, only 17 at uh, UPS and are fod, so I got a ways to go there. Yeah. I love that. And one final comment from Rhonda talking about how strange of a time we're, we're navigating through here. She says, last night, our local news in Arizona was talking about the fact that folks are selling their homes and are taking their major appliances with them due to supply chain issues with appliances uh, getting new ones. Any is that some of what you're seeing and then some, huh, Steve? It's all about inventory. Um, you know, I've heard it from several friends and colleagues. Hey, it's time for uh, mom to get a new uh, washer and dryer. It's uh, going to yeah. take six to eight weeks because it's probably still sitting on the water somewhere. Mm. Yeah, Scott right. just had had that experience, right? I mean, I think you took a lesser model just to get something, right? I did, yeah. Between uh, dishwashers and dryers and now refrigerators, we're feeling all of that pain. And we're, you know, like most consumers, we're trying to fix them instead of having to resort to get new stuff, right? Saving some bills. But yeah. um, interesting time. Yeah. Um, all right. So I want to move. I've got this, I've got a question here from Corinne. So Corinne Bursa is host of our tech talk digital supply chain podcast uh, a mover and shaker out there in supply chain just like uh steve here greg corinne says container positioning has introduced even more complexity in moving global goods good stat on the ability to flex to be able to uh, flex 30 percent. but how much more do we need 20 mm. percent more steve any commentary there yeah you know even talking to some of the care executives right they're always asked how long is this going to last right mm -hmm. how, how long are these rate levels going to stay at the at the peak that they are and the carriers are starting to turn it back around right okay when are the ports going to be uncongested when are we going to get drivers moving freight right but, when are people going to get back to work right get, that's absolutely right so it's not just the ocean carriers right they are absolutely on the front line of the firing squad so to speak uh, but they are just an integral part of this network that we all have to recognize and you know and the one thing that we certainly study with our carrier partners is what's on order from a vessel uh, new vessels certainly equipment right now um, so we're comparing and looking at how the carriers are making those investments. Obviously they're making money right now um, so that allows them to make more investments. 
Um, and we're probably not going to see a real effect of that and probably till late next year into 23, 24. Um, so from the carrier supply side, that's, that's what we see. Now it's really about the demand, right? How are we going to continue as consumers uh, buying grills and treadmills and, and new washing machines? Um, <laughs> yeah. That about it. All right. So Greg, uh, comment before I move into talking about uh, some of the other unique things that Steve and the UPS team's been involved in? Well, I just, there are just so many things working against the market right now, not the least of which is the demand that Steve's talking about. And we're, we are now in effectively the peak half of the year with, with back to school having just kicked off. Um, and, and, and everyone is trying to hedge their bets. These ocean carriers don't want to be exposed. These, transportation carriers, retailers, distributors, everybody up the line has been kind of hedging on building inventories, on placing orders, on bringing more capacity into the supply chain because they've been burned so many times before where they've brought capacity in expecting it to sustain. And there's really no reason to expect that it will sustain at this level. And having been burned before, I can see why they are so hesitant. And and yet at the same time, I, you know, I just suspect, and I, this is just pure speculation, that it's going to reach a point where some of these carriers, some of these participants in the supply chain are going to go out on the edge because they just can't take it anymore or they mm. feel like you know, they're going to be convinced that it's going to sustain. And they, they could be wrong and it could be catastrophic for a company like that. So I, 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 I think that you know, we're going to have to do what you did, Scott. We're going to have to substitute goods. We had to do the same thing. We had an air conditioner go bad. We couldn't get the sear level, sear level that we wanted, the efficiency level that we wanted. We had to take what we could get. So, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of substitution, which is also going to cause flux in the right. supply chain. Excellent points. Yeah. Okay. You got some, and you got some secondary players coming into the market too, right? Some of the right. Asia yeah. players, um, some maybe domestic barge type players saying let's let's get in the game on right. certainly on the trans pacific eastbound but you well know, and steve you know carol said i think it was last week or at least it was reported last week that carol tomei your ceo right you know who she is i think <laughs> these so. guys those guys might <laughs> um, but um she said that delivery volumes are expected to be five you're supposed to be what is it five million packages short did she say per week uh, or per day. Anyway, it is woefully inadequate, even once we get it here, right? right? So the problems are not solved. And that's just current volume. So yeah, anyway, the, you and, know, I'm, this, I'm, and I'm one of the old guys, Greg, I, I would be the traditional shopper. Last Christmas, I bought it all online. Right? Scott, mm -hmm. well, you know, Scott and I talked about that as well. We're late shoppers. So we're going to have to get on the ball here, or there's not gonna be anything left to buy. That's true, exactly. right? That's so, true. part of the silver lining here, going back to appliances and whatnot, you know, we'll see a shot in the arm with when it comes to remanufacturing and 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 more options, uh, and more things getting recycled and reused. I believe uh, in in the years ahead, partially out of, out of necessity, but also partially out of innovation. So we'll see. But Steve, we're talking about as as you've laid out and Greg has spoken to, and all the folks in the comments, these are um, unique. To put it, um, to, to, to to won't do it justice. These are these are terrible. Thank you for not times. saying unprecedented. Scott. Right, thank you. I, I, I try to avoid all the cliches, you know. <laughs> right, but, but Steve, you know they call for not just innovative but creative problem solving, and I know that you and and the team there at UPS has been doing just that. So give us some stories, a story time. Give us some examples of some of the these unique yeah. solutions that, that y'all been involved in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously stated earlier, you know, it's it's UPS, the global network, very integrated. Um, we are, you know, air freight, customs house brokerage and our compliance group. Uh, and then obviously a, a very strong North American air freight network. Um, that's the global freight forwarding world that we live in. Uh, there is our global logistics and distribution team. And then there's our Coyote partners. So all under the supply chain solution and it really is right now about solutions. Mm. Um, <laughs> our, our, our president, Philippe Gilbert, 
and, and the, the region management team um, supporting the three business units are, are close as we've ever been uh, because this, this, this pandemic situ and the, the supply chain situation really is forcing these things to happen on behalf of our customers. Um, you know, again, I'm the ocean voice, um, but there's so many other peers and counterparts in the how UPS supply chain is really coming together to, uh, to bring those solutions. You know, when I, when I think about, you know, I've been on two customer calls already today. And of course, just like today's podcast, you start off with the realities and then we get into the solutions and what can we do? Yep. Um, and, and the way I've kind of termed it here internally is it's got to be about dynamic routing and know how to pivot. Um, you know, I, I talked earlier about purchase order, right? That traditional model, issue that PO 90 days ago, expect it to be booked a couple of weeks in advance and let it ride, right? Today, that PO needs to be dissected potentially 10 times. And if I need to take 10% of that order out of Shanghai and air freight it, you're going to have the best air freight network at UPS. If I'm going to potentially uh, move some of that international small package even, right? Even that is part of the dynamic routing that I'm referring to. We have a unique product at UPS called preferred LCL. So instead of kind of that trade down from air freight is our preferred LCL. And we're going to put that in a consolidation. Again, we're going to take a percentage of that PO not moving in the traditional FCL world. We're going to put it in that console box. And then when it hits in the US, it's going to go into that North American air freight network that I referred to earlier. That's going to just moving to the Midwest, to the East, you can save 40, 50% transit time. Now, wow. there's still congestion, right? There's still capacity. We still got to have a container to move that box. But once you get that moving, it, again, it's to divert or to diversify and give yourself some options. So we've moved, you know, we, we count it all in kilos. And, uh, you know, we, we're, we, we started this back when the air freight rates were skyrocketing in the first half of last year. But what customers are realizing now is that's a viable solution, right? It's not just an air freight trade down. Mm. It's some critical product. I can't afford to air freight it. I can't afford to put it international small package What's my best alternative? Preferred LCL is absolutely a, 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 a game saver for a lot of our customers today. Well, hmm. talking about that traditional model and with your last phrase, that, that game saver, that traditional model feels like starting pitchers going nine innings, uh, Steve. It doesn't happen <laughs> anymore, right? You've got to be That's able right. to – you can't ship it and forget it. You've yeah. got to be able to uh, truly – dynamically ship and 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 pivot make different decisions um uh find some new options in transit it, it's a remarkable time yeah. hey scott um, it's it's like the uh tampa bay devil rays right let the closer come in first yeah right, right. Mix, mix it all up and, and i think that's that's the dynamics of what we're dealing with and the companies that can be flexible um that can really dissect those orders and let's keep in mind these retailers right the buyers their job is to get product on the shelf. The logistics guys obviously take a lot of pressure there. And I, I sat in those chairs in, in the big box retailers. You know, the merchants now have to be part of the decision, right? The, 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 the way to split an order or write a second order or minimize an order, it, mm. it's tripling and quadrupling their work too. Right. right. Um, but if they want product on the shelf, that, that's exactly what they're going to have to do today. So Nirfad says, going to one of the points and advantages that you, you're speaking to, dynamic routing is something, he says, uh, that a lot of logistics providers are afraid of or or at least are not practicing. Mm -hmm. He says you got to come up with solutions, and it takes creativity and, and, and um, inner fortitude. <laughs> you can't well, get it also it. takes systems, and a lot of logistics providers simply aren't equipped from a technology standpoint or, or a, a breadth of service options to be able to do it. I mean, I think that's the huge advantage that the big carriers like you, UPS have, Steve, is, yeah. is that you've got the technology to be able to do it and you've got the physical logistics capacity to be and, able to do it. And we have to keep investing. Um, yeah. You know, I can tell you our, our visibility platforms, we've been doing that, but it is, 
it is the lifeline today, right? Because you, you planned a transit time, you planned an ETA, getting that product to a distribution center, to a store, that date's got to be right, right? Yep. Then, then retailers can make different decisions. Production, manufacturing can make different decisions. Uh, we're going to continue to spend time, effort, money to, to make that better. Um, and it's difficult, right? It's not all on the ocean carriers again, right? It is an integrated network that has to come into that visibility platform. And, and one of the buzzwords out there right now is predictive, right? Predictive analytics and being able to look at these dwell times by port, by rail ramp. Um, those investments today will make service providers stronger. For yeah, sure. well said. Um, all right, so just a heads up, folks. We're going we're gonna to touch on it at the end of today's live stream as well. But on September 1st, UPS is hosting a virtual summit. Um, and we want to make sure, I know the link will be in the show notes. Uh, Amanda or Clay or Jada, if we can drop that into the comments so it's there real convenient for folks. Uh, but you'll need to join us as we take a deeper dive on the 1st. I think Greg and I are sitting in on a panel yeah. to talk about uh, a lot more practitioner stuff when it comes to to ship and things where it's got to go across global supply chains. Okay. So Steve, um, you know, you, you're, you're speaking to a lot of the unique situations and unique solutions that you and your team have been providing. Um, let's, let's shift gears a bit and let's talk about some key lessons learned from the, you know, the wild, wild west days of ocean shipping, global supply chain, your pick, but what are, what are some of those key lessons learned that are going to stick with you? Yeah, I would I would say it starts with, and again, some of these are buzzwords, but they're so critical today, planning and forecasting, right? You know, our our industry as a whole has not been really good at that, right? Um, how you plan your, your quantity uh, or minimum quantity commitments to the carriers, how our customers plan and forecast with us as an NVOCC. Um, but more importantly, it's that transit time planning that I talked to earlier, right? Don't use that traditional 35 days to Chicago right. anymore. Right. right. And and getting a merchant, a new buyer at a big retailer to understand that it's not 35 days anymore, it's 62. Um, planning and forecasting, absolutely critical. Uh, I would say flexibility, maybe around the dynamic routing thing I brought up earlier, but being able to go multimodal, being able to not be afraid to move some of this product air freight, try that preferred LCL type of option. Um, you know, port diversification, right? Everybody says, how do I vo avoid Long Beach, right? But challenges are certainly in every port in the US right now. Um, one of my colleagues was flying into LA Long Beach, took a shot from his air airplane window a couple of days ago, and there you see the 20 vessels. Right. But you can go to Seattle, to Savannah, to Charleston and, and see some similarities. And, and it's just managing the throughput. Right. They just yeah. uh, they, they, they just can't handle that same type of volume. But you got to diversify. Right? right. And that's what it all comes back to. And, and then there's the transload. Right. The ocean carriers are very clear. They want to be in the port to port business. They don't want to be in the chassis business anymore. They don't want to be in the inland moves. So the traditional IPI allocation is going to be a huge challenge. Um, it's a challenge now. Yeah. We think it's going to be even greater. So the integrators that have capabilities for the port facilities to be able to move into 53 footers, to be able to find that capacity in the long haul uh, in the local dray is, is going to be critical. And, and when you say learning, Scott, that, that is absolutely what we are showing our customers and what they're learning every day, that there's going to be a cost factor, but there's going to be a better reliability factor if they'll take some of those chances and risk with us. Love that. Uh, Greg, I'm going to come to you next, maybe for some of your key lessons learned as well. But before I do that, I think Rhonda's going to join us for that 9-1 virtual summit uh, with some of her organization going through some M&A activity. She's going to be more involved. She's rolling up her sleeves, perhaps. Rhonda, that's a great, uh, a great. Um, Love to have you, Rhonda. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Azalea says consumers also are expecting more out of transportation. They're expecting more out of everything, I think, that touches from e-commerce to supply chain, transportation, you name it. No one, she says, wants to wait more than three to five days to receive something, no matter where you are. Really, that's, that is Yeah, well, we're getting. 
we're getting and we're going to continue to get a dose of reality on two day and same day and three and five day delivery because <clears throat> um, that you know we're we're already seeing it and I think you're going to see that trickle down to from the big big cost items to the kind of everyday items not toilet paper of course uh, we've made enough for the next century I'm sure but um, but I mean there are still issues with every everyday products right right um, we, you know well, I think one other thing that Steve spoke to Greg. Uh, and that is similar to the pandemic, the challenge of the pandemic, right? It's not, it's not confined to a certain city or town or region. It's everywhere. And uh, with port congestion, it's, it, unlike in years past, decades past, it's been at this port, that port, it's so widespread. And it just so much co uh, more complicates um, what we're all uh, and practitioners and leaders are trying to, to, to move stuff. Uh, and plan and forecast, which of course we love around here, Steve. Yeah. Talking our language, especially oh, Greg White. But Greg, um, you're you know what else you want to weigh in on some of the key learnings you've heard from Steve or in general? Yeah, well, labor, labor. Um, you know, I'm going to keep coming back to that. We are s seven months past needing to pay people to stay home, and that is that is the root of all evil in the supply chain. It's why we have raw material shortages. It's why we have shortages in in the ports on the ships in the trucks on in the factories in the stores in restaurants anywhere there is a shortage of labor it's because we are paying people more to stay home than they made in their previous jobs and so why would they work that's big um the other thing is to to steve to your point to challenge the forecasting and planning and replenishment mechanisms of a lot of these companies um i think that's that's precisely placed we, we've talked about this in the last week or so also scott the if you know there may be no peak season for you if if you haven't already ordered and land and in this case many cases probably landed your goods as well and you would have had to have expected the kind of delays that you that we've been seeing right for nigh on eight months now so it there's no reason that there's no real excuse for retailers to have lagged in that regard. And um, those that have, you know, they'll be riding the razor's edge. Yep. If, if they rolled the dice, they may have come up snake eyes by this point. Absolutely. But I'm, I'm curious on that point, Steve. Um, when you talk about this dynamic routing, I, I envision, so I come from a world where you order from a supplier, right? And now that may be a diverse set of goods, but ordinarily that purchase order would have items with the same lead time on them from the same source. It, it, is dynamic routing necessary because you're seeing retailers or whomever is ordering, you're seeing them order a, a, an even broader stack of goods on a single PO, maybe from multiple locations or with multiple lead times. It, is that what necessitates the need? I think it's a little bit of both, Greg. And, you know, again, if, if it's that front cover ad, and you got to get product on the shelf. I got to air freight it. Right. Yeah. Versus, you know, and then if some of that same order, if it's an M if it's a replenishment order, to your point, maybe not as dynamic. Yeah. It all depends on those inventory levels. Um, and again, if I need to split an order to go 50 percent East Coast, 50 percent West Coast, just in right. traditional FCL mode. Um, you know, those are all creating those those uh, internal challenges for customers because they need labor to cut orders. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. You got to read. You got to send eight, six, 860 POs for PO change to the manufacturer. Right. Um, all of those things are, are are keeping everybody in the supply chain looking at it from A to Z from that from that angle. Really interesting. Really yeah. interesting. I, want to share there, I mean, there are solutions for that. Not not. You know, this is not on UPS at all, but there are solutions for that that can help these companies optimize those orders more efficiently. It's surprising to me that it's still so prevalent that there's so much manual intervention in these orders. We're still yeah. signing in triplicate, perhaps, in, in, in some organizations. <laughs> we, may That's right. That's right. we may be, right? And, uh, and, and we haven't talked a lot about it, but obviously, you know, the cost, right? Yeah. When, when, you know, I think the days of moving a 40 foot container from Shanghai to L.A. at 1500 or less are long gone. And, forever. Uh, you think forever, forever, 
Um, and I think that's carrier discipline. Um, but I, and I think it's kind of the new norm that we're going to find some level ground eventually. Yeah. Um, but there's no doubt premium and super premium rates um, just add to the frustration uh, because supply chain budgets are are way out of whack and we're only halfway through the year right now. So uh, do you think that that pricing is staying up because you think that demand will remain up? Is that our, our prediction is through the rest of this year for sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. And yeah. probably into next year. Yeah. Play the Chinese New Year traditional. And then, okay, what does negotiation mean? Okay. Our traditional yeah. April, May. What does that really mean in the future? Um, you know, I think longer term contracts, what does that mean? Um, and, and I don't think the, the ocean carriers can answer that specifically today. Right. Uh, we know how the negotiations work. BCOs and NBOs and everybody else. Um, I think we're in a state of change, which has been a very traditional model, right? right. You know, go to the TPM conference and and everybody <laughs> sit down and fight for the best rates. It, it's not about that right now, right? right? It's about flexibility and capacity. It's not great. You think Maddox. we'll come back to a more a more standard level of equilibrium? I mean, maybe fifteen hundred is gone forever. But th does it approach start to approach a more normal rate, or is it that the carriers have been supplementing um, freight for so long they're not willing to take the lesser margins anymore? Or? Yeah, I, we, again, we're all looking at that crystal ball, and of course, yeah, our carriers, our, they're, hey, they're our partners, right? right. Our carriers, they are truly our partners, and uh, I do think there'll be some equilibrium. Um, I think we're looking well into next year, even into 2023. Uh, again, if that demand stays where it is. Right. Yep. Uh, and we as consumers will ultimately dictate that. So let me yep. get in involved here because I, well I, I, I want to touch on we want to touch on um, anything else you're seeing in the months ahead. But before we do, I want to share a couple quick comments here. Clay, uh, uh, thanks for dropping this again. Join us, Greg and I, and Steve and, and the UPS team on September 1st. The link's there in the show notes and in the uh, commentary. Also, I want to point out, Stephanie mentioned she's got parts coming out of Shanghai to Grand Rapids, Michigan, that have exceeded 80 days on multiple occasions. Our, her average is running around 62 days, and that tees up Corinne's question here before we get to a moving forward uh, final segment. Corinne says, Steve, did you say that typical ocean transit times have increased from 35 days to 62 days? Yeah, Karen, I was giving an, just an example because, look, depending on the terminal it comes into in Long Beach, depending on how that rail ramp is working, it's really why those predictive analytics are so critical um, because every shipment, I mean, we've seen dwell times of two days. We've seen dwell times sitting in the ports at 40. Yep. Right. Um, and that's that's wow. part of the frustration. Uh, and then once it hits that rail ramp, what's happening when it hits the UP and the BNSF coming into Chicago? Right. That's a pretty big challenge right now. Just getting boxes off the rail ramp. Yeah. So, so every shipment is different. It's it's how do you bring some predictability and how do you help that in your planning process? It's so critical. Yep. Gosh, Azalea, you're asking some great questions we're not going to have time for today, but thanks so much for joining us. I'm going to, I'm going to pose, I'm going to get, before we get to uh, the crystal ball out and get some of Steve's additional forward looking thoughts, <laughs> speak, speak to this for a second. We need to Steve. deliver the crystal ball to our guests. Before <laughs> That's they right. Go. But, you know, working from the office, you know, that work from home dynamic doesn't appear to, um, you know, be leaving industry. Uh, as much as folks would like, many folks would like, you know, some folks you know, want to work from home. Some folks want to be in the office. Some folks want to, uh, you know, mix and match. But as Minda Hart said famously, which I love, you know, we've got to make work work for everyone. So really quick, Steve, any, you know, basically, you know, you're in the office now. Um, what as you as a business leader and organizational leader, you know, what are some adjustments that you've had to make? And then we're going to uh, we'll get some of your forward looking observations. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, when we went home last March, I'm like, I've never worked from home in 28 years. Wow. Uh, and so just transforming the work office wow. was a challenge for an old timer like me. Uh, and, you know, we're traditional, you know, meetings and conference rooms and things of that nature. But I will tell you that 
our leadership has uh, transformed. Uh, a you know, UPS is rich in tradition, and and the corporate environment um, had its had its uh, rituals, um, but we have become extremely flexible. Um, you hear a lot about what Carol is talking about from a from a vision and, and how we're being flexible with our people. Um, our supply chain leadership um, is absolutely uh, supporting that, and I think we're we're going to stay with a flexible model. Uh, for the foreseeable future, for sure. Wonderful. All right. I'm going to get a comment in from Jesse, and then we're going to break out the crystal ball. He says, great point. The reality of the market impacts will begin to trickle in more, whereas retailers may have done their best to limit it to the consumers thus far. As long as the demand is there, we will all see and experience those impacts across every industry. Great point, Steve. Yeah, Thank you for I, that. I know that guy a little bit. Oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what? Um, so as we wrap here, start to wrap, um, Steve. Anything else? You, you've already spoken a couple different times about you know, what we can expect now and moving forward. Any, would there, anything else you would like to add to what may be ahead of us in the months ahead? Yeah, I, I think it's buckle up. Um, you know, I, as our He's on the right <laughs> show. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna. We're going to go through a bumpy road here through this whatever peak season is in the next few months. Um, you got the traditional Chinese New Year. Again, what's negotiations mean for us all uh, coming into the second quarter? And then when's that capacity going to come on board? And, and where's that demand, right? Mm -hmm. what, what's mom and uh, your aunt and your cousins and your friends and your neighbors uh, predicting here, right? Um, right now, it's the demand is strong and i think that while they'll when that capacity comes back we'll see some level of equilibrium uh, but those negotiating days have changed forever um, greg to your point earlier and uh you know working with a partner like us um, is to give you the insights give you this integrated network that we've talked about today and uh you know give you options um you know you know Trusted advisor is, is can can mean a lot of different things, but uh, when you're working with the people at UPS and our supply chain solutions, we truly mean it, and uh, look forward to more and more challenges ahead that we can help you solve for. Awesome, Andy. well said. And Gary says, "Hey, great show today, guys. Always learn something from supply chain." Now, thank you very much for that, Gary. Thanks for the comments there and feedback there, Rhonda. Steve is uh, you can tell, Greg. Steve's been around the block and then some. And so when a, a savvy veteran with, you know, 28, 30 years experience says to buckle up, man, yep. you, you better listen and take heed, right? <laughs> yeah, I totally. I mean, I think what what I've heard here in both tone and in, in word is that Steve is as flummoxed by this as, as, as any of the rest of us are, even though he is literally providing the solutions every single day maybe not as flummoxed as the rest of us are but still <laughs> more flummoxed than you're comfortable with right um because you know when you've said a couple things one is solutions has never meant more never meant what it really means today than it does today uh, because it is one problem after the next and it is really not just offerings not just provisions, it is solutions every single day. Every so, single day, every yeah, single day. Love it. Hey, supply chain makes it happen. I appreciate what uh, yeah. all of the practitioners out there from drivers to fulfillment center employees, warehouses, manufacturing, and all points in between and then some. I mean, that's really what is, is moving us ahead. And Steve, you might get a kick out of this. We're interviewing a, uh, a truck driver, a, a award-winning truck driver tomorrow to, I think, offer some commentary that a lot of consumers, you know, it's in their blind spot. So look forward yeah, to that. I'll be Appreciate listening it. in. I'll listen in for sure. All, well, on that note, so Steve, you referenced in the pre-show, uh, our, our uh, show last week where we had a uh, U.S. Bank in Sanmar. And I, I believe you, there was a, a dear old friend on that yeah, show. John, uh, say shout out to John. Hope he's listening in today at Sanmar. Um, I think he's actually going to be in Atlanta later this month. Uh, we do a little bit of ocean for them uh, down in Latin America. And, uh, you know, I certainly heard what John's challenges were. Uh, we, we hear them. I heard them on the podcast, but we've heard them certainly working as partners. And uh, they're just a great company. And uh, I look forward to 
working with John, but it was a great opportunity to listen to you guys too. Well, outstanding. We, yeah, I appreciate it. We do appreciate it, John, and um, the whole, of course, U.S. Bank team that offers a ton of, of data points every quarter. Uh, we always learn a lot there. I uh, really appreciate all of the feedback we're getting. Yes, Barbara, guilty as charged. We're all supply chain geeks. We love this stuff. <laughs> um, uh, Tony, appreciate the feedback there. Um, Azalea, I'm with you. Every day really does count. Amen. Matthew mm -hmm. and Simon. Simon, great to see you again. Love that yeah. headshot. Um, so uh, let's make sure. So we've talked about um, the September 1st virtual event. Steve, you'll be there. I imagine you'll be a keynoting or, or on a panel or something. Right? I, th I think Alex and the team have signed me up for a few of those things. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, look forward to all of, our, all of your guests being our guest on uh, September 1st for the UPS Supply Chain uh, Virtual Summit. Wonderful. And again, the link for that will be in the show notes. They're also in the comments. If you're listening to the podcast replay, it'll be very conveniently there uh, where you can click on one click on the show notes and register right there. Okay. So Steve, beyond the virtual event on September 1st, how else can folks connect with you? Hey, hit me on LinkedIn. Uh, we'll start there and uh, you know, I will work with my marketing partners and we'll continue to to branch out and uh, make sure you get as much insight from our sales professionals, from our marketing teams, and uh, certainly from the expertise of my group around the world. Wonderful. Uh, Steve's been there and done it, and I bet he has asked to weigh in on, on uh, conditions, shipping conditions, and a lot more uh, day in and day out. So y'all connect with Steve and check out the virtual event. Okay, big thanks. We're going to have to have you back so we can talk about um, – Frankly, I want to talk about barbecue. And, no kidding. Uh, we need a supply chain chow show. You know, there's that other event on September 4th. I think you guys are paying attention to as well, right? <laughs> yes, we didn't Georgia. talk about Georgia football, but we'll have, That's to, right. we'll have to do that next time. <clears throat> we'll, we'll wait till the, we'll wait on the outcome. We won't we won't be predictive about that. We'll wait and see what the the results are, and then that'll can dictate our our uh, right. discussions. But no I'm just saying, I'm with you, Steve. Uh, go dogs. <laughs> Uh, breaking my heart, breaking my heart. <laughs> but hey, big thanks. Uh, you mentioned Alex. Uh, I really appreciate him and, and the UPS team for what they're doing. You know, yeah, creating content and guidance and best practices, and um, you know, being having access to SMEs like Steve and, and the rest of the folks. That's critical as we navigate through these times. So big appreciate, uh, big thanks to what Alex and and you and the whole team are doing there. But we've been chatting with Steve McMichael, Vice President, UPS Ocean Freight. Steve, always a pleasure. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Enjoyed it, guys. Have a great day. Thank Take you. Take care, Steve. Man, I, he, um, you know, I saw a little bit of Sandra McQuillan and yeah. Mike Griswold where in, in Steve, basically, especially amongst other things, where he could take a complex – situation that it might take 30 years of experience to really understand and break it down and, and put it in, in simple terms so that more folks that maybe aren't involved in shipping can pick up what he's putting down. Is that what you picked up on as well, Greg? I did. I, I caught all of that. And I'm not sure that in my opinion, his most important comment could have been glossed right over. And that is that we, the consumer, will be the determinant of how this market evolves over time and the pace at which it does so. And it would have been easy to miss that comment, but Scott, to think about that somebody is on the complete opposite end of the supply chain, dealing with getting boats across the ocean, right? Um, and doing so at a, at a good cost and with all of the complexities that he has introduced, that all those complexities that help improve the opportunity to get those goods there in time, but that he recognizes that the consumer is the beginning and the end of the supply chain. You know, that's impressive and probably is the reason that he's so damn good at what he does, frankly. I, I mean, you know, you know that I preach this all the time. We have to recognize that we, the consumers, are the catalyst for everything that happens in the supply chain, whether it is demand, whether it is supply, whether it is pricing, it's delivery time, whether it's fair trade, sustainability, whatever it is, we are the catalyst. We vote with our wallets for how companies will engage in the supply chain. And he's clearly got his finger on the pulse of that. And that is a really, really rare trade. Agreed. So. 
And hey, uh, one of the phrases I, I certainly picked up on, or a lot of folks in the comments and skyboxes picked up on, is dynamic routing. You know, if your logistics provider is not offering, is too scared of dynamic routing to use Nerfod's um, uh, comments, you ask the tougher questions and find someone it is. I mean, if any of situations called for anything other than ship it and forget it, you know, uh, now's the time. So I well, love what he spoke about there. There, and he also challenged retailers and other shippers to be uh, more preemptive of those issues. I mean, he's right. had to he's had to enable that dynamic routing because we in the retail trade are still, frankly, a little bit sloppy with how we pos place and position those orders. Right. Too much stuff that is not meant to be shipped together on a single shipment. And you know, if we if we help ourselves a little bit then Steve and his team can be a lot more helpful to us at, I'm sure, a much lower cost. Mm. Well, uh, begrudgingly, I've got to bring this conversation to a close. I know we it. A, we had a blast talking with Steve, with UPS, yep. and, of course, with you and all the folks in the comments. I appreciate all the uh, comments and questions. I could, sorry we couldn't get to all of them. I agree with you, Azalea. He did drop the truth indeed. Did indeed. And a key takeaway, folks, it's not Greg Maddox pitching a complete game, 87 pitches at two hours these days. The game has changed dramatically. Make sure you're partnered with folks that can get it done. On that note, you got to make sure you're partnered with folks like Greg White, right? Trusted partner you can count on uh, to say what has to be said, such as buckle up. we got some tough days ahead. That was another That was another <laughs> truth bomb right there, man. That's right. He, well, hey, he folks, could be one of our hosts saying stuff like that. <laughs> hey, you never know. You never know. But – Y'all check out the September 1st event. Join us there. We're, we're looking forward to the panel. We're going to be on. Uh, make sure you check mm -hmm. out supplychainnow.com for more conversations just like this. Find us and subscribe to wherever you get uh, your podcast from. But most importantly, most importantly, Greg, hey, do good. Give forward. Be the change that's needed. Be bold. Be fearless. And on that note, we'll see you next time right here at Supply Chain Now.